Okay. Let's take uh, what seems to be a complex topic. It's not a complex topic at all. It's everybody loves to complicate it. Censure, sa censure. <laughs> sensor saturation. Um, what's the dynamic range of your camera? What is it that you're exposing for? Obviously, losing shadows is one thing. Blowing out highlights is another. That's okay in certain shots um, uh, to blow the highlights if they don't comprise more than a few percentage of the scene, or if the composition calls for it. And there are not many times where blowing highlights are called for in the composition. There are some, like some strongly backlit, backlit uh, halo-like scenes that are ethereal. Other sort of scenes that uh, are the composition that you go for. Generally speaking, the human brain does not like looking at uh, the aesthetics. The cosmos esthetos in the ancient Greek does not like looking at blown highlights. So what is sensor saturation? Exposure obviously is gain and time. Gain is of two varieties. Obviously gain is your aperture, what you have your aperture set at, which of course obviously affects depth of field. We all know what the time variable is. The other uh, side of gain is on your sensor, but it's not just the sensor because your camera is not a sensor. And all these people say, you know, what sensor is in your camera? I give a damn about what sensor is in the camera. I care about how it processes that information. Um, hardcore example would be like the Nikon D610 versus the D750. Both are exactly the same sensor, yet the D750 processes a high ISO a lot better. ISO has no connection to... Uh, exposure by the way it's not actually technically part of the exposure triangle in the conventional sense of film ISO it is input gain um, not volume like you see on a radio there's actually gain knob and a volume knob on more advanced ham radios what are we talking about sensor saturation well what is it that you're trying to expose for what do you want to set the midtones at if you know if you have a really strong specular in the dynamic range you're seeing, if you actually take a look at the shot and you know what it is you want to expose for, you'll be able to see how radically far the shadow details that you want to capture are from the specular highlights. I mean, it could be an overcast day with some uh, moderate speculars on the waters, for example. But the dynamic range is not so extreme that you need to set, uh, for example, a spot meter of uh, the waves or you know, the light glistening off of uh, a water, the uh, bright, uh, turbid uh, uh, waters, uh, you know, more than a stop or stop and a third. So what is it that you need to meter for? What's the saturation point that you know your sensor is at? Um, I was talking about yesterday. I seem to confuse a lot of people. It's not that I didn't make the video perfectly clear, but it is really simple. What is it that you're setting, you're telling your camera the midpoint is? The best way to actually teach yourself what exposure is is not to go out and bracket the hell out of every shot, that'll actually teach you something too, is but to stick your camera in spot meter and go out, evaluate a scene very quickly, point it at the specular highlight, and you'll very quickly learn where that should fall. Usually it's about two stops over. Your camera, remember, wants to turn everything into gray sludge. I did um, some mapping using a software and uh, white balance cards to determine that, for example, on the Nikon D810, the dynamic range is 7.7 .7 stops with a midpoint to specular clipping point of 2.7 stops, or 2.7 EV. So that basically means I have three stops over uh, midpoint before uh, my uh, speculars are clipped. Well, if I'm outside, say I'm shooting a, a car with a bright chrome with the sun glistening off of it, what would I want to do? If I wanted to get the most and uh, some really strong specular scenes, say some white concrete versus the shadow side of a car, you say you want to grab the shadow side of that car, the sun's beating down at this angle, but you want to capture some of the detail and the shadows on that side of the car. What would you meter for and how would you instantaneously intuit You know how much you need to go? Is it an overcast day? Is it a sunlit day? First thing someone's going to do is mention the Sunny 16 rule. Okay, well, it just makes things simpler. Bring your camera to spot metering. Say it's a really strong backlit, uh, uh, excuse me, a really uh, strong uh, sunny day, and your speculars are really stark. 
relative to your shadows. It doesn't take much training for you to say, hey, my specular highlights are, you know, easily seven, eight stops above my shadows. I want some of those shadows. I know I'm going to lose some of them, but I want to squeeze every bit of orange juice or every bit of dynamic range out of my camera possible. In such an extremely strong uh, lit situation, I'm going to meter for my speculars. And since I have 2.7 stops above, I'm going to set my camera for two and a third or two and, three, two and three quarter stops above what my spot meter reads for my speculars. You also need to know where to read for your speculars. And I'm going to lock in my exposure with exposure comp set to two and a third or two and uh, two thirds uh, stop of exposure comp, positive. I don't even have to look at the back of my LCD screen after I've taken the shot. I know I have evaluated the scene mentally. I know that my Nikon D810 has 2.7 stops of EV before I clip my speculars. I know my D500, while this technically still reads the same at 2.7 as I mapped it, it's actually less than that. The uh, Nikon D500 is very quick to clip speculars. So I'll actually always never set my Nikon D500. And I can do tonal mapping too in Lightroom, but I want to do as little of that as possible. I want to get as much... Uh, juice out of the uh, the shot as far as uh, the saturation levels that are reached at my sensor before the speculars become oversaturated. What do I mean by oversaturated? Basically the buckets that define the specular highlights on my shot start to fill over, spill over if you will, and then we, of course we've got a lot of uh, totally blown blobs. Now I can do some tonal mapping in Lightroom and actually uh, pull back my specular highlights, but if they're completely blown, even Lightroom isn't going to fix that. So I'll never actually go over uh, one one and two thirds stop on metering for a specular highlight on my Nikon D500. Um, damn iPad. On the Fuji X-T2, I actually have more latitude. I've got 3.2 stops of EVA. So like saying a really strong a day, I'm taking the same picture of that car with the chrome, sun beating down, I want to capture some of the detail of the reflection in that chrome. It's like, well, you know, chrome is chrome. You know, I just end up with some blown speculars in the chrome. No, what if I want, you know, the details of the reflectance in that chrome? All that detail is going to be lost. If I just meter for that, I want to retain the details as much as possible in the chrome, for example, on that bumper on a bright sunny day. I'll uh, set it for two and two thirds or even three stops. I know I have three stop, three point, almost three and a third stop of latitude on specular highlights on my Fuji X-T2. If I do that, then I've got the reflections and the details in the bumper. It's one thing to lose detail and shadow. If the contrast to the dynamic range of the composition that you're shooting is so extreme that you lose it, that's fine. You could actually uh, push some of the shadows and tonal mapping in Lightroom. But even if you don't want to do that, you know that at the very least, if you're being, a pay, you're being paid to do it, obviously you, you need to do stuff like that. That's one of the reasons why you need to train yourself in Lightroom, for example. Um, you've gotten the most out of what your sensor is capable of. The easiest way to think about it is just go out and spot meter and start thinking in terms of saturation. I mean, is it an overcast day? You know, if it's overcast, then I know even my speculars are not that very far from my shadows. If it's a bright sunny day and, you know, the sun is shining off the water or off a chrome bumper of an antique car that I'm shooting, for example, or off of the pavement that some parade marchers are on. You know, I don't want to blow that out. So what am I going to do? And yet still retain the detail of my mid-tones and as much shadows as I can. By knowing the clipping points of the specific camera that I'm using, and you should know the clipping point. I know that I can spot meter for those speculars. It's like, today's an overcast day, Okay. I'm going to go out and shoot all over, shoot out all day in the overcast. Okay, so I really probably don't need on the Nikon uh, X-T2 any more than two stops. I'm just going to set the exposure comp at plus two stops because I'm going to have some strong backlit scenes. I'm going to meter for my speculars. I'm going to lock in that exposure. I'm going to recompose, half press my shutter release button to focus on my main subject and then take the shot. 
Um, where's the neutral point? It's wherever you choose it to be. If you only want, and the composition in your head tells you that you only want exposure uh, for the highlights, and you want that sort of composition where a lot of the shadow detail is lost, you're going for effect, you know, there's no proper exposure. That, that, and what amazes me is that actually amazes people. It amazes me that that amazes people. So what's proper exposure? Well, you know, looking at this, there is no proper exposure. If you want most of your shot to be uh, blacked out and you only want to see the highlights, if that's what you want, you think that's what the composition demands, that is the correct exposure. Your camera doesn't know correct exposure, but the bad thing is that you don't know what correct exposure is. And I don't mean like, well, you know, in this particular dynamic range situation, we have seven and a half stops of available light uh, from our shadows at, uh, on, uh, you know, zone two. Uh, well, we got all the way up to a zone nine. Yes, we're gonna take a, we're gonna take a one degree reflectance meter reading. Yeah, there we go. No, I'm talking about if you look at the situation, what is it that you want the composition to appear as? Why does everything have to be perfectly lim Why do we have to go for maximum dynamic range? Not everything has to be HDR photography. I mean, I think two of the last winners from the photo contest that everybody agreed on were shots that were technically so not properly exposed. They were exposed for the highlights. Those were stark, beautiful images. You know, one way of subject isolation is obviously depth of field. Well, I'm going to isolate my subject at f1.4, f1.2. It's like, yeah, that's valid. What about isolating your goddamn subject by metering only for the highlights on that person's face? Say the light's coming in here, single light source. You know, and there's a bunch of busy shit going on all around the subject you're shooting. Just meter for that specular highlight. Everything else is going to get lost in the shadows because you have chosen that your midtones are you going to be your speculars when you choose that your speculars are going to be your midtones then your speculars become your midtones and what that means is that the shadows get dumped into the trash and if the composition calls for that great some of the best shots in the world is an exposure that your camera is telling you this shit ain't right you're exposing for the highlights. So what? You know, you're supposed to be the photographer controlling the goddamn camera. The camera ain't supposed to be controlling you. You need to know what to expose for. But once again, you need to know that blown speculars ain't too hot unless there are one of a rare different number of situations of which there are very few where blown highlights uh, are desired for that composition and there aren't too many. So... Sensor, sensor saturation is just getting about all the dynamic range juice that you can out of your camera. But that doesn't mean that's what you have to do in every shot. I mean, that's what snapshots are like. This camera has 10 segment matrix metering. And no matter what the situation is, it is going to try to turn everything into an average of mushy shit. Matrix metering should be called uh, averaging everything to produce mushy shit. It's like, what's that metering... And they used to call it matrix metering. Oh, they decided to rename matrix metering what it really is. Yeah, what did they rename matrix metering? Average everything it average everything into mushy shit. What would be the acronym for that? Average everything A E I M S. A E I M S. Average everything into mushy shit. You know, like gray porridge. That's what matrix metering is. It's gonna evaluate everything and then average it. So it produces an 18% of, like the color of this table. Every camera in the world, currently in production, wants to turn any scene situation in matrix metering. It takes the speculars and the midtones and the shadows and it tries to, it takes the calculation of all of those and it averages them together to produce this. This gray, mushy, bleh, table that I have my hands on. Every camera is designed to do that. You're supposed to override that. The metering is supposed to be here. The only thing you need to know about your camera is what sort of specular headroom you have before the highlights are blown. If you have a really tricky situation and you want to keep as much of your shadows as you can and yet not blow your highlights, you need to know the dynamic range of your camera. 
I did these charts myself with a Sekonic meter, um, white balance test cards, and some software. I know that I've got 2.7 stops of EV on the D810. It's really like two stops on the D500. But I got three and, uh, three and almost a third stop on the X-T2. That's where the headroom is really important. The dynamic range is a lot more on the D810. People talk about, well, when you have an FX sensor, you really have uh, the ability to retain shadow detail. That's true. If you actually look at the dynamic range and the clipping point, I have 4.1 stops of EV from the midpoint down into the shadows, which means that when it comes to processing the D810 file, in Lightroom, I got a lot more detail to pull out of the shadows than I do on the D500 or on the Fuji X-T2. La 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 la, there's the advantage of a full frame camera. So, just learn, you should really learn what matrix metering is. You should go out for a week or a day at least and just spot meter everything. Stick it on the specular highlight. Okay, and realize that it's going to be different on a bright sunny day where the dynamic range is like this as opposed to an overcast day where the dynamic range is like this. So I'm going to spot meter on a day like this. I might only need to stop in two-thirds on spot metering my specular highlights. On a day like this where it's really bright and sunny and there's a huge difference between the highlights and the shadows, then I'll spot meter my speculars and do upwards of two... Uh, two and a third, or uh, two and uh, two and uh, two thirds uh, stop of uh, positive exposure compensation. Not on the D500, however. <laughs> so that's all the light meter is anyway, except when it comes to stroboscopic work and studio work, which is uh, for calculating lighting ratios. Which is the only way you could do that is with a light meter, by the way. Um, in normal uh, outdoor situations, which most people don't uh, would not need these for, but for ultimate like landscape photography, if you're going to travel a thousand miles and bring a six thousand five hundred dollar medium format camera, if you got a brain, you're going to bring a light meter, and you're going to sit there and you go click 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 click, and you're going to squeeze every last drop of juice out of that freaking camera, which cost you $6,500, and which, a location, it took you a 1,000 miles to reach. You're just not going to go out there and set your shit up and take a guess. It's like, why the hell do you have a $6,500 medium format camera? And you traveled a 1,000 miles to take that landscape shot. If you're not going to squeeze every last drop of dynamic range out of your camera. When people, you know... When people say stupid stuff, they're like, what the hell do you even have that camera? That's what a light meter is for. Your camera can't do it. Sure it can. No, it can't. You know, unless you want to sit there and like bracket a hundred different shots at different exposures, and some people just do that. I'd rather just like go, okay, I'm going to take an average. I'm going to click, 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 spe specular mid-tone highlight. Click the average button. Oh my God, there's a button here on here called average. And it'll tell me instantly what it is that I can do to get the maximum maximum capability out of my camera. So, I hope you learned something in this. I hope. Just realize your camera hates you. And your camera always wants to turn every shot into this gray table here. Because that's all matrix metering is. Learn what to expose for. Diffuse, shadow, specular. Where you place the uh, exposure meter at and what sort of specular highlight you have with your camera tells you the shot you're going to get. And you can see it in your head before even looking at the LCD screen. Trust me, that is really true. I see the amateur photographer, they take a shot and they look at their LCD. They take a shot and they look at their LCD. Take a shot, hit the play, look on there. They don't know what the hell's going to appear on there. If you're confident in knowing what's going on, you only need to look at the LCD screen. I check it periodically, but no. Thanks for watching. Catch you later. Bye.